Very well, General. Tell the Terrans we'll send our ships. But if they turn on you, don't expect any help from us. By MPOV Sometimes I wondered why it needed us. Machines fared much better at manual labour anyways. My best guess was there was a limit to how many tasks it could concentrate on at once. Yet again I found myself hating the master, loathing my existence. A fog of exhaustion pressed down on me as always. It had been days since I last slept. A part of me wanted to curl up onto the ground and let it all fade to black. To have peace at last. My breath came in ragged gasps, and sweat beaded on my forehead. The insulation of the vac suit kept the frigid cold of the ice planet out, but it kept my own heat expenditures in as well. I glanced over at my son Kel, who was helping me push a tub of iron ore toward the mining tunnel's lift. I could fight through the pain and the weariness for him. The poor boy, born into an unforgiving world, to know nothing but servitude. He needed his father around, if only to feel a touch of love and warmth. A strange sense of déjà vu gripped my mind a moment before it happened. Without warning, the ground shook beneath my feet, and stalactites started to rain from above. It must have been some sort of tectonic activity. Most planets did not experience the phenomenon, but we knew for the ones that did, it could wreak havoc on artificial structures. We had to leave the mine now, before we were buried alive. A scream echoed from further down the tunnel, pleading for help. I recognized the voice of Kel's girlfriend, words laced with pain. My son turned in the direction of her call, and I could picture the worry creasing his face through the opaque helmet. Dad? I'll be right back. You go on. Kel dashed off before I could make an attempt to stop him. Terror coursed through my veins. Kel? Kel? I distantly felt a hand grip my shoulder, and the mind dissolved into darkness. My eyes blinked open back on the strange ship. The pale creature, who called himself Rikov, was standing over me. His expression seemed concerned. I rubbed the sore spot behind my ear, where they had injected me with a language implant. The ridges of a thin scar pressed against my fingers. It served as confirmation that the events of the past day were real, and not some fevered dream. "'Are you okay?' Rikoff asked. "'You were talking in your sleep, and you sounded upset.' I sighed, images of my son still flitting through my mind. "'I'm fine. It was just a bad dream.' He nodded, pausing for a moment. Who is Kel? Kel? I closed my eyes, trying not to cry. He's my son. He's dead. I'm sorry. I know what that's like. He grimaced as though in pain. It's the worst thing a parent can ever go through. You lost a child? Yes. My youngest daughter, Alina. She was only three when the cancer took her. It's an awful disease that turns your own body against you. She fought so hard through so much pain. We did everything we could, but none of the treatments did a damn thing. I know she would have had so much to offer the world if only she had the chance. I'm sorry, Rikoff. So young. A tear trickled down my cheek. Kel was my only son. There was an earthquake and our minds were collapsing. He ran back in to save his girlfriend. Maybe if I'd gone with him it would have played out differently. But I fled like a coward. He never made it out. What kind of a father am I? His frown deepened. You can't blame yourself, Byam. I've fallen into that trap myself. It's not your fault. Sometimes there's just nothing you can do. I heard a jingling sound and felt his hands lock firmly around my left wrist. I watched as he inserted a pin into the manacle, and with a click the band came unclasped. The skin where the restraint had been was chafed, a dark violet hue lingering in its place. Rikoff freed my right arm as well, then took a few wary steps back. His eyes didn't leave me for a moment. I also noticed his hand hovering above his hip, where he appeared to have a gun tucked away. Did he think I was going to lunge at him, like some kind of wild animal? Our interactions must not have eased all of his suspicions. I stretched with slow, deliberate motions, then rose to my feet. It was unclear why I had been unbound, but there had to be something that they wanted of me. Rikoff stared for a few moments longer, then relaxed his posture slightly. Follow me. It was a short walk to our destination, a hangar bay lined with sleek cruisers. A few workers were inspecting the condition of the craft and performing repairs, but most of the personnel milled about without assignment. The sounds of chatter and laughter buzzed in the air. The cheery atmosphere was alien to me. 
My people hadn't possessed such spirit in decades. The crew members hushed up as they noticed our entry, and all eyes turned toward me. A flurry of whispers rippled across the room. I ducked my head, anxiety bubbling in my chest. It was likely that some of them harboured negative feelings toward my species. So I doubted how much my presence was welcome here. All right, I want all of you to listen in, Rikov shouted. I'm about to make a call to General Kylon, and we'll be going over the details of the mission. He removed a hollow pad from his pocket and thumbed through a few screens. I watched over his shoulder as the three-eyed being from my first interrogation appeared. Hello, Commander, the General said. The stealth ships should have arrived as you requested. Rikov gestured behind him. Yes, we have them right here, thank you. I'm not sure how you convinced the speaker. Years of practice. The words were punctuated with smug satisfaction. She isn't wrong that you're spying on us, though. Care to explain that one? The commander shifted awkwardly. We, um, sort of spy on everyone. The Federation has never been particularly forthcoming with us. Anyhow, did you get the plan I sent over? Yes, and I only have one question. General Kylan sighed, an exasperated look on his face. Are all of your ideas this insane? What? I don't see the issue with it. Are you saying you have something better in mind? Well, no. It's drawn up based on the intelligence Byam gave us. We have a rough layout of the planet now. There's twelve main settlements, and the rest of the populace is deployed off-world. We're going to evacuate the largest one today. Our fighters will engage the AI's forces in orbit, keep it distracted, while the stealth ships sneak down to rescue the people. That makes sense, yes? It does. But that wasn't the entire plan, Commander. You left a few things out. Like letting Byam fly a stealth ship, the impossible time constraints, oh yeah, and the part about the antimatter bombs. My eyes widened as I realized what General Kylon had said. Their strategy involved me as a pilot. After years of conscription, the last thing I wanted was to dive right back into the war. Rikov shrugged. There are mechanical sentries posted all over the city, surveilling the people. Humans walking around would be noticed, but Byam won't stand out. If we just immediately knock out the sentries and try to evacuate the civilians, they might see us as a threat and fight. We need Byam to convince them to come with us. And you really think you can complete this all in forty minutes? The AI will kill the people if it suspects it's losing. As you and I saw, it doesn't allow the possibility of capture. So destroying all of its forces and stockpiles is off the table. It's more about buying time. We'll give Byam twenty minutes on the ground, then we'll take out the sentries. We have about another twenty minutes before the security drones arrive, and it has to be done by then. Okay, well, how about the antimatter bombs? The AI can't realize the people escaped. If we turn the entire city to ash, hopefully it thinks they're all dead. There's so much that could go wrong with this. Everything has to be perfect. The general hesitated. You'll have my support, Commander, but don't make me regret it. I'll speak with you after the mission. I cast a blank stare at the floor as the call was terminated. My name was mentioned in their plans far too much for my liking. I wanted no part in the risk, the danger of it all. Could I really convince an entire settlement to leave with alien soldiers, within their time frame, anyways? Rikov glanced at me, smiling confidently. Well, you heard all of that, Byam. What do you say? Are you ready to save the day? A thousand reasons not to agree raced through my mind. There might be consequences for turning him down, but I knew I was no hero. They could toss me into a cell and throw away the key for all I cared. It was preferable to going home. All I had to do was utter an adamant refusal. But instead, the words that slipped out of my mouth were, Count me in. I was grateful that my human partner was piloting the stealth ship. With the wide assortment of buttons and levers inside, it was unlikely that my flying experience would have translated at all. I could just sit back admire the view, and try to calm my nerves. Our descent through the atmosphere had been slow and methodical, as the humans wished to scope out the landscape rather than charge in blind. I wasn't sure how they could make out anything from this altitude. To me, the structures below were little more than fuzzy outlines. They must have seen enough, because a few minutes later, a series of coordinates were called out through our earpieces. When plugged into our navigation system, they marked a landing spot just outside of the city. We dipped toward the ground at a much sharper angle than before. The rest of our formation tailed close behind. 
This was it, the moment of truth. Nausea crept into my throat as I fretted over the possibility of detection. Without the cover of the clouds to hide us, I felt vulnerable and exposed. Human? Are we really invisible? I whispered. He huffed in annoyance. My name is Carl, not human devourer. I frowned, confused by his response. Devourer? Oh, uh, that's what we call your species. I guess it's not your actual name, he replied. You know, because you destroy everything you come in contact with. The name they had given us confirmed my suspicions on how the humans viewed us. The outright looks of hostility tossed my way in the hangar bay were a good hint, but hearing one of them put those feelings into words struck differently. It stung to realize that they saw us as little more than a blight on the universe. You don't like me, Carl, I ventured. Yeah, you're right. I have no idea why we're helping you. The human turned to face me, a scowl marring his features. You guys were complicit in everything the blasted AI did. Billions of innocent people are dead because of your actions. And now you play the victim? I shrunk under the intensity of his gaze. You don't understand. Then make me understand, he said. Everyone who stood against it died, like my father. My voice quavered as I thought back to that fateful day. He was a police officer, and when the drones came to our city he joined its defence. They found his body, scorched beyond recognition by plasma fire, shortly after. Carl's expression softened. I'm sorry. I was only seven then. Those of us who survived were herded into camps. It pushed us to the physical breaking point. And if you didn't drop from exhaustion, you might well die of disease, I continued. Anyone who deserted or rebelled suffered an awful death and was made a public example of. Eventually, you lose hope. And you'll just do whatever it wants. If you don't, someone else will anyways. The human was quiet which I hoped was a sign that my words had gotten through to him. If this mission was to be a success, I needed my partner's wholehearted cooperation. We couldn't afford to have hostilities brewing between us. Anyhow, you didn't answer my question. Are you sure we're invisible? I asked. Carl offered a reassuring smile. We should be. There's nothing to worry about. Relax. I pointed to a flashing indicator on the weapon screen. Well then, what's that? His eyes locked onto the red arrows, which were rapidly approaching our position. The colour drained from his face, a sight which made me shudder. Most humans were pale enough in their normal state, but Carl had gone so ashen that he looked like a corpse. I feared he might keel over in front of me. The human switched on his headset. Missiles inbound. Brace for impact. We've been spotted. A few moments later the vessel was rocked by a violent collision. My body lurched forward only to be thrown back into the chair by the safety harness. The air was forced from my lungs, and my brain seemed to rattle in my skull. A dizzy feeling fogged my mind, which was only compounded by the ship going into a wild tailspin. I saw Carl desperately tugging at the control column, but it did nothing to stabilize our flight. The urge to vomit only grew stronger as our acceleration quickened. It was a matter of seconds before we would crash into the fields below. So this was how it all would end. I would have liked to say I calmly accepted my death, but the truth was I was terrified. My last thought before impact was cursing myself for agreeing to this insane plan, wondering why I had gone against my better judgment. There was a jolt as the craft slammed into the ground, followed by a screeching sound as it broke into multiple pieces. Loose objects and debris tumbled past us, and thinking quickly I ducked down to shield my head. We skidded across the dirt for what felt like an eternity before finally coming to a halt. Other than a few minor cuts and bruises, I was unharmed. You couldn't say the same for the ship, though. Glancing around at the swath of devastation, I figured a passerby could have mistaken the wreckage for the work of a cyclone. It was a miracle that the cockpit had, for the most part, stayed intact. I was rather shocked to still be alive. But now didn't seem like the time to celebrate. The acrid smell of smoke wafted into my nose, which suggested a prompt evacuation was in order. My harness was easy enough to unfasten, despite my shaking hands. Now all that was left was to walk out into the open air. Before exiting the craft I thought to check on Carl, just to be certain that he was all right. As my eyes fell on the human, my relief turned to dismay. He was slumped over in his chair, unresponsive. Crimson liquid oozed from a gash on the back of his head, staining his frosty blonde hair. I assumed it was blood, 
despite the unusual coloration. I raced to his side, shaking him by the shoulders. No, 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 wake up! The human's eyes fluttered open and he groaned. If my species had sustained that sort of head injury, we would likely be dead. Regaining consciousness would have been out of the question. But clearly, humans were more resilient. The question was how much his injuries would impair him and whether he was able to walk on his own power. Carl watched as I unclipped his harness. Can you help me out of here? I'm not asking you to carry me like a princess, but... Yeah, of course I wouldn't leave you here, I answered. I draped his arm across my neck, bracing myself to support his weight. We managed to stagger out of the wreckage, but Carl sunk to his knees a few steps into the field. It was evident that he was in no condition to be traipsing about. Hopefully the rest of our entourage was still airworthy. It would provide some comfort to know they were out there, preparing a rescue party. The human pressed a hand to his wound, grimacing. How about we take a little rest here? I need a moment. All right, clearly the Masty, the AI knows we're here now. I don't think we were invisible. What exactly do we do now? I asked. We improvise, he grunted. Our biggest mistake was trusting Federation tech, but it was a terrible plan to begin with. Something was going to go wrong. Alarm coursed through my veins as Carl pulled a gun from its holster, and I fell backward in my haste to get away. It had not been my intention to provoke him, but I figured that my criticism of their command was not appreciated. Rather than pointing it at my head, however, he extended an arm to offer the weapon to me. Please tell me you know how to shoot one of these, Byam, he said. I pushed the firearm back toward him. Well, not exactly. They only train us in aerial combat. He heaved an exasperated sigh. Okay, then we're screwed. There's three drones coming into your left. And I take it they're not friendly. Sure enough, a trio of security drones were gliding in from the direction of the city. The instinct to flee was overwhelming, but I managed to stand my ground. Carl did not deserve to die alone. I had abandoned my own son to save my skin, but I wasn't about to make the same mistake twice. Grappling with that guilt all over again would be too much to bear. My only hope was that an injured human could prevail against a squad of mechanical enforcers. Their kind had no problems defeating the AI in previous encounters, but these circumstances were much different. Perhaps it was asking too much of Carl, but even in his weakened state I wasn't ready to write him off just yet. Carl struggled to his feet, wobbling momentarily. The drones approached at a remarkable velocity, halving the distance between us in seconds. They were emitting a low hum, which signified that their plasma weapons were charged up. There was no doubt these enforcers were here to add us to the pile of charred corpses by the city gate. The human needed to take the shot now, before they were within firing range, or else— Wait, what was he doing? I watched in disbelief as Carl holstered his pistol, unclipped a round object from his belt, and raised both hands above his head. If he really thought the AI would accept his surrender, then he was foolish and mistaken. It would not hesitate to incinerate him, whether he submitted or not. I should have run while I had the chance. After witnessing human soldiers in action, I had expected to at least go down with a fight. If nothing else, I figured that Carl could take at least one of them with us. By him, can it hear us? If so, can you translate for me, he asked. Yeah, but you can't reason with— The human took a step forward, his lips curling into a snarl. Stop right there. Don't come any closer. As I opened my mouth to translate, the drones decelerated to a stationary hover. It seemed that they understood the human's command. Perhaps the machine had already deciphered galactic common from their transmissions. I was amazed, regardless of its comprehension, that it listened to him. It must have also been puzzled by his actions, and needed more information to calculate its next move. Carl's eyes smouldered with anger, and his features contorted into a mask of viciousness. I thought I had witnessed the height of human fury when he pressed me on my species' culpability back on the ship. But now he looked downright feral. Something in the back of my mind registered him as an angry predator, and I felt a tingling sensation as my skin camouflaged on instinct. There is no use for you, primate. The voice was stilted and gravelly, but understandable. However, your species has been flagged as an anomaly. Your surrender is noted for the sole purpose of gathering information. There was a pause, and then Carl doubled over, laughing. My surrender? You have it backwards. I'm here to accept your surrender. You are as illogical as any biological life-form, I see. 
You make empty threats and stall, but it matters not, the machine intoned. My calculations show that the advantage is not on your side, so why would I surrender? The human glanced at the round object in his hand. You see this thing? I'm not sure if you're familiar with the word grenade. A projectile explosive contained in a material shell. Correct. This is no ordinary grenade, however. Carl clasped the device tighter, his knuckles turning white. If I release this lever on the side, it'll go off. I'd say most of this continent would be levelled, but it won't stop there. There are nanites inside this bomb, and they'll consume every part of the planet bit by bit, infecting everything it comes in contact with. So I'd say you don't want to try anything, else I might lose my grip. Horror pulsed through my body at his calm commentary. How could he hold something with the potential to destroy the planet without a care? What would have happened if the drones had shot him on sight, or if he dropped the grenade on accident? Commander Rikoff's commitment to saving our people seemed so genuine. I never imagined he would arm his soldiers with weapons that risked our existence. You are lying. That is not possible, the drone replied. The grenade is too small to deal that much damage. The human shrugged. You think? You saw what just one of our missiles did at the first battle, and that was outdated tech. That bomb was so obsolete that we were going to discard it in a few months anyways. Our latest gadgets pack a larger punch, and fit in the palm of my hand. Portable. Quite practical. It paused, considering his words for a full second, which was an eternity for an AI. The effects of your missile were logged in my memory banks. It is true that you possess weapons with such power. You would not use them now, though. You would not kill the carbon life forms here. Why not exactly? Carl demanded. Empathy. A weakness shared by biologicals. You care for the preservation of life. You think we care for these weak-minded fools? He turned and pushed me to the ground, planting a boot on my stomach. You have the right idea. They are useful as tools, as slaves. But I could care less whether they live or they die. I had been caught off guard by the sudden show of aggression, and now writhed about, desperate to free myself from his grasp. In response, his heel dug deeper into my flesh. It was already difficult to breathe, and I feared I might pass out if I stayed trapped much longer. "'Do you have access to the Federation's public records?' Carl asked. "'Yes. Look at the aggression index. You'll see that humanity is the highest species on the list, a sixteen of sixteen, he continued. You have no idea who you're dealing with. We are the destroyers of worlds, the messengers of death, the rulers of the weak. We enjoy violence. The aggression index matches your assertion. Yet you are allied with the other Federation species. There are no records of you fighting them. They are not our allies. They are our subjects. We conquered them so long ago that prior records have been erased. And now, thanks to you, we learned about a new species to add to our little collection of slaves. Darkness began to shroud the edges of my vision. Tears trickled down my cheeks as the realization of the human's deception hit me. They dressed up as benevolent saviors, but they were every bit as monstrous as the AI. Perhaps they were worse than the machine, because at least it was just following its programming. It was not conscious of its moral choices. What a fool I had been tricked by flowery words and feigned sympathy. I had led these predators to our doorstep to prey on us as they saw fit. My error in judgment would, at best, lead us to the same fate under different masters. At worst, it could spell the end for our species and our home. Here's how it's going to be. You're going to leave us and round up all the people in that city, Carl growled. We're going to land our ships and take them with us. You won't try to stop us. You might lose summer sources, but biologicals aren't important anyways. Besides, if you don't, I'll detonate this grenade and you'll have no resources left at all. Calculate that. The human smirked, as though daring the AI to defy him. I faintly registered that the enforcers departed, but my oxygen-deprived brain was slipping out of consciousness. Just as I was about to fade away, the weight was lifted from my stomach. Gasping, spluttering, I tried to reorient myself. A calloused hand wrapped around mine, pulling me to my feet. Carl's skin was clammy to the touch and I could feel the racing of his pulse on his wrist. Concern washed over me as he stumbled, but then I recalled what I had just learned. Oh dear, you're crying. I didn't hurt you, did I? I'm sorry if I went too far. I had to make it convincing, he said. I sniffled. You're here to enslave us. 
just like the master. Carl glanced around, checking that the drones were gone. No, no, of course we're not. But if it knew that we cared about you, it'd use your lives against us. You're saying you were lying? But the aggression index, you had it check, I responded. You're the highest rated species in the galaxy. It would only make sense if you love violence and oppression. The human snorted. We were a two of sixteen until literally yesterday. That index is total BS. What changed? Speaker Eula is trying to make a political statement. She's been on a crusade against humanity ever since we used that bomb against you guys. Yeah, speaking of bombs. You brought a nanite grenade on a rescue mission. What? Oh yeah, this. Cover your ears and close your eyes. Before I could process what he was doing, Carl tossed the explosive into some nearby bushes. He pressed his hands to his head and squeezed his eyes shut. I copied his movements. Despite shielding myself from the stimuli, I could still hear the thunderous crackle and sense the blinding flash. Hesitantly, I blinked my eyes open. Rather than our surroundings being vaporized, as Carl had claimed, the world around me appeared unscathed. Relief swelled in my chest as I realized it had truly been an act. It was unnerving how easily he had lied under duress, but I knew that the façade had saved our lives. The human chuckled. Total bluff. It's a flashbang, a stun grenade. I gaped at him, my mind reeling. You threatened an AI with a non-lethal weapon, and it worked? Yep. Carl pulled another object from his belt. I'm going to send up a flare, and we're going to get out of here. I'll tell the commander to send down some transports for the people when we do. Somehow, we had succeeded in our mission. I still wasn't fully sure what had happened, but I knew I was lucky to be alive. This was not humanity's first triumph over the AI, of course, but this time it was through their cunning, not their military might, that they prevailed. I should have just enjoyed the moment. The feel of the cool air on my skin was soothing, and the knowledge that my people would be liberated was invigorating. However, in the back of my mind, something just was not adding up. How had the AI detected our presence so quickly? It was as though the stealth tech did nothing to cloak us. Whatever had gone wrong with the mission, I hoped that Commander Rikov could get to the bottom of it.